Next up, we have our first student speaker of the night. Michael Grant is a junior. introduction. He's a junior majoring in music and also studying film. You might also know him as the music director of the Beelzebubs. Uh, and tonight he's going to be talking about how our perceptions of identity and taste may be unnecessarily limiting us in our relationships with music. And if I do say so myself, in taking a fresh look at pop music, his idea really is, his talk is the text ideal of an idea that is going to be new to many of us, most of us, but also while well relating to all of us. Um, so here it is, the second movement of our symphony tonight. Take it away, Michael. So, I did something recently. Hi, Michael Grant downloaded and listened to an entire Nickelback album, <laughs> the whole thing. For those of you who don't know Nickelback's work, they were almost universally the answer to the question when I asked a bunch of friends, what band does everybody hate? <laughs> Not a wonderful claim to fame. But I forced myself to sit and listen to the album, and here's the kicker, I liked it. <laughs> So why do I feel a little vulnerable and ashamed admitting this to you? Like I'm at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting and confessing to a get-together with Jack Daniels last night. I I'm a music major. I write term papers on box Brandenburg concertos and Miles Davis. And I, like many of you, love music. I also believe that we can rethink the way that we approach, appreciate, listen, and talk about music. Because I think we are surrounded and overwhelmed by this convoluted yet binary spectrum of good taste and bad taste in music. Of you should listen to this, but not that. This pop music is degrading the holistic integrity of all music and art, while this advanced sonic experience is the fine line of music. <laughs> Nickelback, for example, is omnipresent in this culture, and I didn't realize how caught up I was in it until I put on their album. My initial gut dismissal of them was not rooted in, in any sound or song. It was rooted in an image, an identity, a belief that I, a complex and unique organism, could not possibly like something so unsophisticated or universally hated. That's not who I am. But it had nothing to do with the actual music. And I found that by tapping into the music, those identity barriers fell. Sitting with this album was refreshing because I could let go of this weight I'd been carrying around and just listen and dissect and find what I liked and what I didn't like. So, no, the album didn't touch my soul and by the end I was ready to hear something other than those same three power chords and guitar arpeggio intros and angsty, you can stick me in a hole. <laughs> I, I like a lot of their harmonies and their acoustic versus electric texture mixture and some genuinely catchy melodies. We are what we hear. Musical preferences are part of our core identity, sometimes as foundational as our religious, social, or political ideologies. Many of us cling to them so that any judgment on our musical taste is an affront to our moral fiber and must be fought against like a virus. We, these, and plus, these voices telling us what's right and what's wrong can be so strong that we actually internalize them, guilt-tripping ourselves into shunning that which is different or, or challenging or too mainstream even. We limit our ability to just listen and have dialogue. So yes, we are what we hear, but we don't have to be limited by it. What if we had a set of tools to turn down the noise and tap into the music? It's a strategy to let go of the overwhelming pressures that breed our knee-jerk reactions and open ourselves up to new beauty and engagement in unexpected places. Justin Bieber and Radiohead. Probably unlikely to go on tour together. I really doubt they're Facebook friends. But let's use them as examples of two polarizing artists 
to show that once you strip away these snap judgments, there are actually some common elements to the listening experience. And with an analytical eye, we can see that Radiohead and the Beebs are not too dissimilar. Here we go. When you listen to a song for the first time, or even the twelfth time, everything comes at you at once, right? The lyrics, the groove, the chorus melody, etc. Your previous assumptions about the artist, but add on a music video on top of that, and of course the deeper flow, and those variables multiply. So let's take a look at what's actually going on here. We have the same drum beat that goes on throughout the whole song, very centered on beats two and four. Right? And this, this synthetic clap track unites the somewhat disparate rap verse with a high falsetto chorus while maintaining that chill vibe that's at the root of Mr. Bieber's central thesis. Um, Yo, I'm gonna be the best boyfriend, but I'll be chill about it. This, this rhythmic vibe is coupled with the acoustic guitar to continue to give the listener that he's just serenading you one-on-one -on, -one on a front porch in the summertime. <laughs> this, <laughs> Mr. Bieber is clearly growing into his voice here as well, and he's showing us both his boy falsetto as well as this sexy yin-yang twin style bass whispering. <laughs> and I'll be damned if you aren't humming that chorus melody as you walk out of here. It's catchy. When, when approaching a new song, we can try isolating its components to find what works and what doesn't. Maybe this means really taking a look at the lyrics, or finding that one chord that works for you. Being open-minded carries a lot of weight here, and checking in with your own initial reactions can be a powerful tool in mitigating or challenging your defense mechanisms. But this doesn't mean we aren't allowed to dislike something. For me, I think Justin sounds great on the singing parts. His falsetto is clear, he nails most of the runs, and even the gratuitous moans and swag sort of walk the line between cheesy and hot. <laughs> With that said, the synthetic clap track and whisper verses and high electronic comic sound don't work for me because they distance me from the authenticity of the acoustic and intimate feel. For you, it might be completely different, and that's fine. Here's Radiohead. So Radiohead has this strange complex surrounding it, wrapped up in this good music versus bad music debate. The feeling of, oh, I'm supposed to like Radiohead because they play good music, coupled with their often inaccessible or challenging songs, leaves people feeling guilty. Let's let go of that for now. It doesn't help when trying to discern what works for you and me. I chose this song, Idiotech, because it was an electronic departure from the group's earlier work, and there's some legitimately strange things going on here. But if we dig underneath the surface again, we can find that there are actually some common elements with Bieber. In both, we have this reappearing high falsetto chorus with a four chord pattern. That means that for all the weird stuff that's going on with Radiohead, it's still just four chords, and I'll point them out here. <coughs> Here's radio, uh, here's a uh, beaver. So say hello to for seven three, two, I'd like to be everything you want. Yeah, let me tell you. Right? Just as we talked about with boyfriend as well, Idiotech also has this synthetic drum loop that really drives on beats two and four. <laughs> and they both use background and foreground textures that weave in and out. So just as with Boyfriend, Idiotech can be dissected away from the knee-jerk I love it slash I hate it. We are all nuanced creatures, so why can't we treat our music that way? So there is something to be said for sitting back and letting the music wash over you. And this may feel tedious. 
But you can find merit even in the smallest corners. Maybe you just like the message of Idiotech, which is generally interpreted as speaking about climate change. Or maybe the backbeat drum loop and boyfriend lets you let go and dance after a long day. Regardless, it means you're tapping into the music itself and not the idea of what that music means. My criteria may be completely different than yours. In fact, I hope it is. Teach me about what you like and why you like it, and teach each other. Because finding that kernel of value empowers us. These set of tools are, are not unique to music majors, and they're not even unique to appreciating music. It's a way to welcome the unfamiliar, to sit with discomfort, which is hard, and be conversant with something that, that challenges or upsets you. And it plays out everywhere, from, from political party lines to religious divides to sports rivalries. It's a way, to, it gives us the power to really listen to each other, hear one another on the other's own terms, and find some common ground. And finally, it allows us to find and embrace our own identity, removed from who we think we're supposed to be, empowered by an internal compass and a keen ear. Thank you.